The title of my talk is The Political Economy of Gene Crops and the Trajectories <coughs> excuse me, of Social Movements in Argentina. And as Mike said, I will be presenting portions of my book, Soybeans and Power. So today I'll be talking just to give you an overview of the talk. I'll, I'll present some questions. I kept the theory and methods short, but at the end I'll go back to the theory. I'll give a brief overview of GM crops and agrochemicals at the global level to then talk about Argentina and my field site in Formosa and explain the mobilization and end up with what's the takeaway of all this. So let me start by presenting the, the events and the puzzle that guide the book. In 2003, agribusinessmen spray agrochemicals in fields of genetically modified soybeans in a community that I call Monte Azul in the north of Argentina, in a province called Formosa. These agrochemicals were carried by the wind beyond the intended areas of application and destroyed the crops grown by peasant families. Women, men, and especially children had headaches and muscular pains. And they also had episodes of skin rushes, nausea, and vomiting. And these are the pictures that they took and they shared with me showing their skin problems and the affected crops. So these crops that they used to sell in the farmer's market, that I'll explain a bit later, uh, were affected. So peasants responded to this issue with a series of contentious collective actions. They uh, organized several roadblocks in a place that I call Monte Azul, organized by the PESA movement of Formosa, Mocafor, and I will be referring to Mocafor a couple of times. So this is what the acronym, acronym stands for. And they also occupied an airport used by a crop duster, and they sued collectively the agribusinessmen, but they didn't, ha didn't get a response for their demands. Fast forward to 2009, six years after these events, uh, peasant families of Montezul experienced a similar case of ca having skin rushes, nausea, and respiratory problems, and also hundreds of chickens died suddenly, and these are the pictures that they took uh, and they also share with me, but no disruptive protest occurred in this second case of agrochemical exposure. So, as you can imagine, I'm setting this up for a comparison between 2003 and 2009, where people uh, suffer health problems and damage in their crops and animals due to the effects of herbicides used in fields of GM soybeans. And in 2003, people responded to this social and environmental threat with a series of contentious collective actions, but in 2009, they tackled tackle this problem individually and no protest took place. So the question is, why did people from the same community first react by organizing protests and later on remain apparently passive? So I use these specific events and these specific cases to answer broader questions. Uh, and these are, what are the unfulfilled promises of gene crops in social and environmental terms? What challenges do subordinate groups face when seeking to address environmental problems threatening their livelihoods and their health? Uh, what obstacles do they have to overcome, to act collectively? And how do subordinate groups resist? And this will be, I will focus a lot on this today. How do subordinate groups resist, but also negotiate and accommodate environmental threats and agrarian change? So I compare these two moments, looking at three dimensions. To I look at institutional poli politics and the role of authorities, to social movement organizations within and between. So within, but uh, when the world for, for example, called mobilization within movements, and I look at the relationship relationships between movements, and I also look at the subjective dimensions in terms of meanings and emotions. Uh, so as I told you, I'll, I'll keep the lead review light at the beginning, but just to situate the book, to give you a sense of what the book is about, it's an intersection of a couple of sub-disciplines, meaning the book will be over here and at, at the intersection of agrarian and peasant studies and rural and environmental sociology on one hand, and social movement studies and political ethnography on the other. So this translates in this object, uh, object of study, agribusiness, Peasant movements and GM crops and pesticides, and questions about demobilization, the politics of development, and how power works at the micro level. Um, so, 
Before getting into my study, I want to give you a brief overview of GM crops and agrochemicals, very brief and looking at the global level. And what I'm going to uh, talk about is about GM crops that are mostly concentrated in these four crops, cotton and corn that are pest resistant, and soybeans and canola that are herbicide resistant. So these are, by and large, the four main GM crops that we see grown around the world. And just to dispel a common misunderstanding, GM crops do not have necessarily higher yields, as many people think, because they confuse them, I think, with the crops of the Green Revolution. But their main advantage is that they simplify large-scale production. And what they ultimately do, this is what I argue uh, in the book, is that herbicide-tolerant crops like Rwanda Brady soybeans uh, perpetuate agrochemical use, created, creating what I call and others a uh, transgenic treadmill, meaning that create, these crops create environmental problems that the industry tried to solve with more genetically modified crops, right? So who, where, where are these, these crops grown? Uh, this gives you a, a, a snapshot of the global area planted with GM crops. And what, what you can see here is that the, the USA, Brazil, Argentina, and Canada uh, represent more than 75% of the global area planted with genetically modified crops. And an interesting point for the purpose of uh, being invited by the Latin American Studies Program is to emphasize that 42%, oh, sorry, 42% of this area is located in Latin American countries. And Argentina was one of the first countries to adopt genetically modified soybeans and played a key role in the expansion of GM crops in South America. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a couple of minutes. But who control these seeds and these agrochemicals that go with the herbicide tolerant crops? So this is another graph that I want to show you. And what this shows is the concentration of the seed and agrochemical market. So these are the uh, seed companies, the, the dominant seed companies around the world. And these are the dominant agrochemical companies around the world. So the top four companies in terms of the global market of seed concentrate 65% of the market. And the top four companies in terms of agrochemical sales control 84% percent of the global market. And I think, you know, we can talk much more about this, but if you look at the names of these companies, are the very same companies that promote, that sell, that patent genetically modified crops. So it puts a pinch of salt if you look at this, specifically this point, a pinch of salt in this discourse of GM crops to quote unquote feed the world, and raises the question of, well, are GM crops actually a way of selling more agrochemicals? So I'm going to leave it at that, but what I want to, the, the next slide that I want to show you, bringing us to South America, is directly related to this company, Syngenta, because this is an ad that Syngenta published in an Argentine newspaper in 2003. And this, uh, so what it says is, you know, they have this map of the, what they call the Republic, uh, the United Republic of Soybeans, and they have this, this cute flag even. And this caused quite a controversy because at the time that this was published, GMCs were only legal in Argentina, Uruguay, but they were not allowed to be grown in Brazil, Paraguay, and Bolivia. But in the subsequent years, uh, you know, farmers uh, took seeds from Argentina, planted those seeds on those countries, and finally got approval from their governments. So what I want to focus on next, I'm going to want to take us to Argentina, Formosa, because Argentina is an important uh, country in this story, because as I just you know, explained, it was the, the sort of point of entry for GM crops in South America. And to give you an overview of the huge expansion of GM soybeans in Argentina, I wanted to show you this graphic, uh, which shows the, you know, this is the year when GM soybeans were adopted. Um, and you can 
to see, you know, at a glance, the huge expansion of uh, GM soybeans in terms of area in, in relatively short time. And that means that today there are 20 million hectares planted in Argentina with, uh, with soybeans. And that represents half of the national area under agriculture. So Argentina produces nearly 50 million tons of soybeans uh, per year, and virtually all this production is exported. And this represents one fourth of the Argentine export. Virtually all of these soybeans are genetically modified, and that means that they use, they, res they resist the herbicide glyphosate. And in any, any given year, this, this number is pretty conservative actually, but in any given year, 200 million liters of glyphosate are sprayed in the Argentine countryside. And this blue bar here show you the growth in glyphosate use in the country. <clears throat> so how does, you know, what are the social and environmental impacts of this huge expansion? So when soybeans were adopted, they were first planted in this region in the, the Pampas, the plains of Argentina that is you know pretty similar to the Midwest in many Midwest in the United States in many respects. And this is an area characterized by you know the oriented towards exports and characterized by commercial agriculture. And many of the farmers here are of European descent and I'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, but in the 2000s five years or so after they were first adopted, these crops, uh, particularly soybeans, were started to plant uh, to be grown here in the north of Argentina, which is socially different from the Pampas in the sense that this area is mostly, the countryside is mostly populated by people of indigenous descent, uh, descent small farmers or peasants. And that expansion created what I call in the book, the dark side of the boom. And I focus on, on one of these consequences, but just to give you another view, this expansion created uh, violent conflicts, including the eviction of peasant and indigenous families, and actually even the killing of peasant uh, activists in Argentina. This expansion of soybeans also was linked to ecological problems like deforestation. Argentina has one of the higher rates of deforestation in the world, um, and also create problems like the appearance of super weeds, weeds that resist glyphosate and force farmers to use even more toxic agrochemicals. And the runoff, uh, the runoff agrochemicals also cause problems of water contamination. What I will focus today on is on agrochemical exposure and the social and environmental problems of uh, people exposed to agrochemicals. So, just to give you a brief overview of how did I go about studying this, uh, I conducted interviews, uh, one year of ethnographic fieldwork spread out in more than a decade. I did archival research, and because I did this work between 2003 and 2015, I call this a longitudinal qualitative study, and I use global ethnography and political ethnography as my methods. Uh, but I want to keep the methods wide so I can speak to a broader audience and also to to talk to you about uh, the quote unquote findings of, of my book. So, but I'll be happy to talk more about this in the Q&A, but I wanna take you to Formosa, a province in the north of Argentina, near the border with Paraguay, and here where I did my field work. And this is an area that in the 19th, uh, in the 19th century, as in other countries with a history of uh, settler colonialism, indigenous peoples were dispossessed of their land and their territory. And long story short, in the 20th century, this province in the Chaco region developed a dual agrarian structure, meaning that there were large ranches uh, growing cattle and small farms growing cotton. And that's why the, this is the provincial coat of arms and it has this cotton ball right in the middle of it, which is, I think is pretty telling. And in the 1990s, these uh, farmers had to deal with a profound process of neoliberalization that I'll spell out a little bit more in a second. Um, 
but I want to I wanted to to show you a couple of pictures of the people that I uh, that volunteered their time for my study because they were growing mostly cotton for self consumption, and as these neoliberal reforms kick in, these neoliberal reforms terminated subsidies for cotton. Uh, prices, like the, the support for uh, minimum prices. The state also privatized the state-owned cotton jeans. And they basically, the, the government since the 1990s started to promote and export commodities. So that created a crisis for cotton growers, which for the most part uh, were small farmers that rely on the state support to make ends meet. And what they started to, to do is to reconvert from cotton production to growing vegetables and other foodstuffs to sell in local markets. And this is a very amateur uh, documentary that we put together with some colleagues. Um, but we wanted to, uh, I'll be happy to talk more about the documentary later. Uh, but I wanted to show you these images of these uh, small farmers or peasants, uh, mainly that uh, they will come up later on again. Uh, but they reconverted to growing vegetables, which was great for them because they can get better prices at local markets. And consumers can also get cheaper uh, prices for their food and also food that was grown without a heavy use of uh, agrochemicals. This was cut short by the, the cases of agrochemical exposure that, I'll, that I'm going to talk about next. But what happens for farmers in this in this province with this expansion of soybeans is that they started to renting lands to agribusinessmen from the Pampas region that wanted to expand the scale of operations. So they rented lands there that were cheaper than in the Pampas. And the production of GM soybeans in this province grew from a meager 250 hectares, which is a small farm in Argentina. I know that you know, <laughs> for some areas, this is huge. But by 2013, uh, GM soybeans were grown in more than 10,000 hectares. And many of these companies rented land in properties surrounded by small farms, on, small farms owned by peasants. And the, what they do once they rent these lands is that they spray herbicides using either a crop duster they use glyphosate and 2,4-D, or they use one of these machines that people uh, call mosquito. And what happens is that when they spray the herbicide, they reach the houses and the places where people live and, and spend their, their time. So, for example, here, the, this whole area that you see between these three and these trees in the back is a soybean field. And this is the local elementary school, and these are kids playing soccer there. And the plants that you see here are soybean plants. So when the mosquito, that machine, sprays glyphosate or 2,4-D uh, here, obviously this reaches the, the houses where, where people live, and also reaches the, the water that they use uh, for everyday consumption. And the consequence of this is that in 2003, the cotton that they, they grew, their leaves uh, were affected by herbicides. People call this pata de rana, frog fall, for obvious reasons. And also, so the cotton balls started to fall, and the mandioca, the cassava that they grow for everyday consumption and to sell in the farmer's market, lost all of their leaves or were withered. The roots, that the, is the part that you eat, got shrink, so they were really uh, affected. So lacking a response to their demands, peasants turn into direct action, the, the events that I described at the beginning. They block up provincial road. Uh, and then following this protest, there was a heated confrontation between agribusinessmen and public officials on one hand, and peasants and activists on the other. So reacting to the protest, the provincial elites reacted through denial, victim blaming, and vilification. They said that the public officials said that the skin rashes and soreness in the eyes and throats were a result of people not bathing very often. And the solution that they recommended was for people to wash themselves with water and light soap. 
And the landowners also said that the protests were quote unquote politically motivated and that peasants were showing a dangerous attitude. So the, the way that officials managed their peasants' complaints further enraged people. So in virtually every interview I had, this point uh, came out spontaneously. And this is the way that Horacio put this situation while we were having an interview. He said, we trusted in the Ministry of Production and the Ministry of Human Development. They let us down. They not only didn't do anything positive, but we also felt insulted. They saw pimples and attributed them to the hygiene of people without analysis, without review, without examining the patients. So they felt insulted, but also they felt disaffected and discriminated again, against. And this is uh, the way that Juana put the situation in her own words. She said, I think that an educated person, supposedly more intelligent than us, should know how to respect people. They thought, we'll tell them anything so they just go away. That was the feeling I had, that they were telling us, go away, stay at home, and if you have to die, die. Emilia, another local peasant leader, combined this sense of disrespect and being with combined sense of disrespect with the accusations of being politically motivated, saying they said that the, we were against the government, that that was the reason why we were complaining. And I don't know, Pablo, a movement, an organization, always makes its claims about rights to the government. Isn't that so? That's why we get organized. Well, then they see us as belonging to the opposition. And it's not true. They said we were just making things up, but they sure treated us as dirty, as scum, like nothing. So peasants wanted to recover their source of income, but they also strived to reverse the mistreatment that they felt and the disrespect they, they uh, were receiving from the public officials. And when I started to do field work and actually analyze my, my interviews and my field notes, I started to show, to, to notice this pattern that in public discourses, Peasants articulated their claims as an environmental problem and an issue of corporate power. But a closer observation of everyday talk uh, showed me that they intertwined these environmental and political claims with, uh, with other types of claims in terms of demands for recognition. Uh, they were enraged by the denial of the events themselves. And they intertwined their environmental claims with claims for subsistence and how to solve their everyday problems. Fast forward to six years in time, they experienced yet again, you know, skin rushes, respiratory problems, and hundreds of chickens died. And they, the peasant activists distributed leaflets in a nearby town, but they could not organize a rally, let alone a road blockade. And this case didn't even appear in the provincial media. So to quickly recap my research question, given these two similar cases of chemical exposure, why did people from the same community react very differently? What challenges do subordinate groups face when seeking to address environmental problems threatening their health and livelihood? And how do subordinate, subordinate groups resist, but also negotiate and accommodate um, environmental threats and agrarian change. So as I mentioned, I compare these events along three dimensions. And for the purposes, for the purpose of today talk, the, in the rest of, of my presentation, I'll talk about uh, how social movements develop alliances with other actual actors. And I'll talk about the internal relationships or the mobilization within movements. Um, so I want to talk, I'm going to explain demobilization, but I think it's important to put that in the context of, of the Latin American left turn that was dominant during the, the years that I did my field work. And obviously, you, most of you are familiar uh, with the left turn if you are affiliated to a Latin American studies program. Uh, but just to give you uh, a sense of that at a glance, you know, these were all left of center uh, presidents that were in power uh, during the late 1990s and early 2000s, only Evo stays in power. But I, I will talk about the left turn in Argentina, 
and the administrations of Nestor Kirchner and Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner that if you have been following the news, she has been yesterday night, has been elected as uh, vice president uh, for, for a new term. Um, and their administrations of the Kirchner, Nestor and Cristina, changed the economic policies and the political landscape of, of Argentina. They adopted a series of Keynesian policies, breaking away with the neoliberal policies of the 1990s. And in building their political power base, they enlisted the support of many social movements, including PESA movements. And an example of this that speaks directly to my cases is the creation in 2009 of uh, something called the Secretary of Rural Development and Family Farming. And this was key because it recognized present organizations and valid actors in agrarian life. And I attended the, in 2009 the ceremony that pretty much looked like a political rally that launched this secretary. And she closed the event, Christina Kirchner closed the event mentioning the importance of having an institutional area within the state that takes into account the small producers of our country. And she mentioned several times the concept of food sovereignty, which, as many of you know, you know is, a, is a concept that the, the global organization Via Campesina has been putting forward. So many organizations took that as a nod to, to their claims and to their worldview. But the other side of this is that Christina Kirchner, just like Nestor Kirchner as well, they created strong alliances with authoritarian governments. And this is the case of the governor of Formosa, Children's France, who has been the governor uh, uninterruptedly since 1995. So next year, he's going to keep the 25 years, uh, you know, the, the, the record of 25 years uh, in power. And this is important for this story because the peasant movements whose constituents have been affected by our chemical drift, drifts live in this province that is a stronghold of clientelistic practices. So clientelism in a nutshell is a bit more complex than what I'm going to say, but is the exchange of political support or votes for uh, resources or uh, favor, basically, in a nutshell. And in this province, this movement struggles to maintain autonomy from this political machine, this well-oiled political machine of the governor that kept him in power for more than two decades. The result of this is that the PESA movement you know, wants to be autonomous of the political machine of the governor, but nonetheless, they act in a context that is pretty much dominated by the logic and the mindset of patronage politics or clientelism. And the result of that is that it creates a very complicated situation for present organizations. So I tend to think in terms of little drawings that I make when I'm thinking. So this is the result of that. And what I want to capture in this, this uh, picture is that the national government the government of Cristina Kirchner, was an ally of the PESA movement, Bocafor, but also of the provincial government. Nonetheless, the two of them were pretty much in conflict and clashing all the time. So the PESA movement had to navigate this very complicated scenario. And what this, what this resulted in is in the peasant movement having to decide and having to face the dilemma between confrontation and negotiation. So this is how Sulma put this during an interview. The thing is, we sometimes confront the government and we don't obtain anything, but we just make our people suffer. We will try other means, for example, presenting projects to the national ministry. I don't want to tell you that we have been defeated or that have we dropped our guard either, I think we should avoid confronting the governor and try to find alternative means to get what we want, which is what we are negotiating with the national government. We are allowing for more participation from the organization. So this situation, this system of alliances, helps the organization to receive resources and keep the organization running, 
but it also creates obstacles for contention and steers the movement from confrontation to negotiation. And the result of this is what in the book I call a process of dual pressure. So let me walk you through this graph. So the peasants who participate in the movement, you know, they provide their bodies to mobilize and to you know, have a critical mass for the movement. And they participate because they want to voice their rights. But in a context where patronage politics and clientelism is very strong, there's an unspoken expectation of receiving something in return for their participation. And that takes the form of welfare resources and problem solving, like you know, everyday problems with the bureaucracy of receiving welfare and all kind of like, you know, grants for the kids to go to school and so on and so forth. So that creates a pressure from below on the leaders of Mocafort, you know, a pressure from you know the the leaders need to deliver deliver basically. Now there's another form of pressure that comes from above because the Mocafort supports the national government and, and national social movement, and they receive resource, resources, not necessarily as a quid pro quo, uh, because they are all share the Peronist ide ideology as well. But what this results in is in a pressure from above, because the resources that they receive from the national government comes with certain strings attached, sometimes unspoken, but what the governor of Formosa tells the national government is like, why are you giving resources to these people who are an oppositional force in my province? So this results in what I call dual pressure. And this is how Nelida put this dual pressure in her own uh, terms. She's a graduate leader of Mocafort. And she told me, we had to join the people from Buenos Aires so that our mates, nuestros compañeros, could have a bit more help. If no one gives us anything, the organization will crumble. It will fall down. People are not doing well, and if they, get some, if they don't get some help, we realize that through the organization, we could negotiate and obtain welfare plans for our compañeros. Lately, I've seen that if we don't do anything, and, we, and if we cannot give anything to our people, nothing at all can be done. They're all poor, and with some help, we are joined together. It's not that much but we are keeping up and growing. So the flow of resources help you know, the organization to keep running, but this also creates pressure for demobilization. And that, this is how uh, Oscar put it in a, in a meeting that I had the privilege to, to be in. And during one of these meetings, Oscar said, the nation, meaning the national government, didn't give us even one peso yet, but we are already busy thinking what machinery we're going to buy, how are we going to spend the money coming from the secretary, and that distracts us from the structure. So this, this flow of resources keep them like uh, spending their time and energy on um, managing those resources, but at the same time, they feel that they cannot like avoid receiving them because they will be sidelined and many of their constituents will go and work for the political machine of the governor rather than participating in the movement. So moving to, to my conclusion, so we have time for, for uh, looking forward for the questions and comments. Uh, in terms of institutional politics, between 2003 and 2009, the authorities moved from denial and disrespect to recognition. In terms of the social movement organization, they underwent a process of demobilization through a mechanism that I call dual pressure. And in terms of their subjective strategies and emotions, people went from enragement to despair and accommodation. So let me take a step back from Formosa, Argentina, and you know, try to share with you what's the takeaway of this, or what is this about? Right? What can we learn from this, or in two words, so, what? so there are two areas that I like to think my work contributes to. One is social movement scholarship. And social movement scholarship, as you know, obviously focuses on mobilization and the emergence of contention. What I argue in the book is that we need to better understand processes and mechanisms of demobilization. 
So many social movements, what studies, what they do is they sample on the dependent variable. Like they take the dependent variable being protest, and we both, we work backwards to explain that emergence, uh, the emergence of protests, and the usual suspects are you know political opportunities, resource mobilization, collective framings, all these facts that explain the emergence of contention. What my ethnographic research shows is that these factors under given conditions can also work as constraints to contention rather than to facilitate contention. So by and large, scholars have explained demobilization in negative terms, saying what is lacking. No, not enough resources, not, no political opportunities there to take advantage of. But what I want to do through ethnographic methods is to show the active production of demobilization. Identify not what is lacking, but to show how peasants mobilize their agency in order to demobilize, to keep the organization running, and to respond to their, the, the demands of their constituents. <clears throat> and I think that this, in turn, zooming out a little bit, can offer the chance of using social movement studies to understand how power works. Social movement studies are useful to understand social change, but I think that we can also use social movement studies to explain subordination and to unpack how processes of accommodation work. Now, the, the, all, the other broad area that I am in dialogue with is global, the, the scholarship on global food regimes. And this uh, literature put history and politics front and center of the analysis. What I like, what I add to this literature is a closer attention to space and place. So specifically, I look at processes of differentiation within nations, which can allow us to move beyond methodological nationalism, beyond thinking of nations as, as units, which is pretty useful if you think in global terms, but less useful if you want to do a case study in one country or look at internal differentiation within countries. So what I do in the book, I use a metaphor saying, well, the, the food regime literature is, is like a world map, right? It's very good to see the world at a glance, and it's very useful to, uh, if you want to locate one country within the map. But if, if I went to Formosa to do field work carrying that map, I will get lost in the dirt roads of Formosa because it's too big of a scale to do that kind of work. Or the devil is on the details, if you want to say this <laughs> in simpler, simple terms. Uh, and in terms of translating this and connecting this to social movement, my work sheds light on the dilemmas faced by local or localized social movements. Um, and specifically how they how these localized social movements have to deal with navigating these several political scales, from the local to the provincial to the national. Uh, many scholars in this literature look at Via Campesina, which is a global organization. It's very important to look at them, and they have great achievements. But we also need to look at these smaller organizations that don't reach that global stage and try to better understand the dilemmas that they have to face. And on a methodological level, uh, my book also seeks to show that ethnographic methods can be useful to study global process like the expansion of genetically modified soybeans around the world. So I'll stop here to hear your comments and questions. But I... Okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep. Argentina's probably the most interesting case in the world with regard to power, both of intellectual properties right, um, mm -hmm. and of the ability to resist international pressures to reinforce the intellectual property regime. Um, um, Argentina, as is widely known, uh, refused to give Monsanto a patent on either Roundup or Roundup Ready Seeds. Mm -hmm. So they have no patent there, which means that these seeds can go across the border into Paraguay and Brazil sort of as, as peasant bread crops, right? Mm -hmm. Now, I'm curious, why did Argentina succeed in resisting this pressure? The United States mm -hmm. trade representative went to Argentina every year and said, we're going to beat you up if you don't give Monsanto a patent. 
and they didn't do it, right? Mm -hmm. Brazil, on the other hand, the Lula government came and so basically gave in on that issue. And yeah. You know, um, Philomena's book on this mm -hmm. raises that question. Why did the power of Monsanto to enforce its intellectual property fail in uh, Argentina you know, you know, you know. and succeed in much of the rest of the world? And the second point is, how does intellectual property have power? So Roundup, the, the Monsanto version of glyphosate, mm -hmm. nobody likes glyphosate. I, I've read reports that it causes homosexuality in Guatemala. But um, mm -hmm. so nobody likes glyphosate and bad stuff. But how does that power express itself on the ground? Mm -hmm. Now in Argentina, I think the case is that China entered the glyphosate market and their generic glyphosate is a fraction of the cost mm -hmm. of Roundup, mm -hmm. which meant that the Roundup label meant nothing and the glyphosate was available. That's now true all over the world. You can buy cheap glyphosate anywhere. You don't need to buy something that's all around it. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, how does intellectual property have power mm -hmm. and how did Argentina defy the power of both the United States and an intellectual property regime that is global? Yeah. Uh, well, great, great question. Uh, I think there are a couple of uh, things that answer your question. First is that in the early years of adoption of soybeans in Argentina, 19, we are talking about 1996. So 1996, only the United States approved uh, genetically modified soybeans. And at the same time, they're approved in Argentina. So, and farmers started to use what is called in Argentina, bolsa blanca, like uncertified seeds, and because they had the right by law to save their own seeds. But they started to, to not only share, but also sell those seeds illegally. Uh, now, I don't, I have to confess that I don't have evidence of this, but for Monsanto, that was a boon in the sense that that uh, use of uncertified seeds, what resulted in is in this huge expansion that I show with this graph. So I, I could never, you know, like I focused on like research on the ground, so I didn't even try to interview Monsanto executives, but, uh, the result of that lack of intellectual property rights, at least in the late 1990s in Argentina, resulted in the expansion only in Argentina, but as you mentioned, in the rest of South America. And for the Argentine state, uh, I think one little number that I show here that the soybean exports are 25% of the Argentine exports explain a lot of what you are saying, in the sense that who gets who gets to appropriate that uh, that wealth? You know, is, is it going to go to Monsanto? Or is it going to go to Argentine farmers and the Argentine state? I think that explains why the Argentine state has been so adamant in terms of uh, putting a, a stop to Monsanto in their claims of intellectual property rights. What is interesting, in a way, and it's a puzzle that uh, maybe uh, somebody can write an article about this, is how Counterintuitively, intuitively, uh, during the neoliberal years, the government was much more harder towards Monsanto. But during the Kirchner government, especially during the uh, latter years of Cristina Kirchner in power, she was much more cozy with Monsanto. In fact, she praised Monsanto and opened uh, with, with her speech in the conclusion of the book. Uh, so I think that you know the short answer is that it. First benefited Monsanto, then Monsanto tried to you know, get money for the intellectual property rights, but it was already too late because the, not only the farmers were profiting from this, but also the national state because uh, since 2002, the, the government started to tax export, uh, soybean, uh, the export of soybeans. Uh, by 2003, it reached uh, roughly 30%. So the, the Argentine state was also a partner in, in the production of soybeans. So that's why it explains their opposition, how they you know, stood up for, for farmers against Monsanto. Does that answer your question, partially? Uh, I guess I want to get into the question of how does intellectual property have power on the ground? Uh, oh, okay. If you go into any, any, any country in the world, uh, some guy in the street can sell you a Rolex watch for $5. Uh, <laughs> and it was, it, the copying and the sort of underground market, the whole book, Oasis Maim, on, on uh, illicit, right? Mm -hmm. the underground yeah. economy, 
it is, it is yeah. tremendously important to seize. And as far as I can tell, yeah. very few governments in the world control the flow of transgenic crops on yeah. the ground. Well, let's keep figuring that out. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, working on the uh, revised and resubmit of an article that talks about the, all the struggle for seed and intellectual property rights in Argentina because one of the the complicated issues is, is as you are hinting to, like how to polish in that and how to actually, you know, you can do that with hybrid seeds because the yield will go down, but it, that's not the case for, for soybeans. So uh, I'll, I'll send it to you <laughs> if, when it's accepted. Yes, here yeah, and then. Mm. Yeah, uh, well, good, yeah, good question. Um, so under Macri, what happens is that, you know, I was critical of the Kirchner because of all these things that I mentioned. Uh, so it was more of a recognition without like following through with material structural changes. But then Macri gets to government and you don't even have the recognition. <laughs> or you have like, they went back to disrespect. By the more concrete policy terms, uh, what Macri did was to dismantle the secretary that I mentioned. They laid off a uh, large part of the, of the people working on, uh, on the ground. Uh, and Macri, what he did was basically to give the management of agrarian policies to the richest landowners and farming associations in Argentina. Uh, a family like people coming from uh, you know, the aristocratic families of Argentina are now running the, the, the public policies in Argentina. So it got much worse in terms of like uh, the deepening of this agribusiness oriented model, but without the softening of this kind of welfare policies that somehow compensated for the damage caused by the expansion of agribusiness. There's another article coming about that. <laughs> Of well, the new the, the problem with with, with uh, you know agribusiness in Argentina, I mean, from a critical point of view, is that you know as I was responding to to Ron, uh, that's the engine of uh, you know agrarian capitalism in Argentina. So the new president Alberto Fernandez already said that the problem with agrochemicals is not agrochemicals themselves, but how do you use it? You can use them correctly and you know not cause harm. Uh, he's also been praising uh, fracking, uh, a place called Vaca Muerta that is famous for the environmental incidents. So um, the you know I'm sad to report that I think this is not going to change much, but at least many peasant movements at least will have, as they had during the Kirchner years, some form of compensation, if you will in terms of welfare resources. The problem is that now the economic situation has been as much worse than in 2003. You know, the, in 2003, five and so on, the benefited from the high price of commodities on the global market. Uh, it's not the same situation now at the global level and at the national level, Macri leaves government with a huge debt uh, with the IMF and with the, you know, the dollar going up the roof. So the, the economic situation is much worse than when Kirchner, uh, particularly Christina Kirchner, took power. So I guess we'll see. Yeah, you have me. Uh, well, thank you very much for your talk. You mentioned some things that I initially was discussing with Robin Sanford. Thank you. Some of the observations that I made was essentially, we have a lot of issues in conventional agriculture that are not exclusive to GM, mm -hmm. like pesticide usage, the work of genetic diversity, and consolidation of the agricultural industry. Um, like that is a problem that goes beyond GM, mm -hmm. uh, and so there are a lot of calls for like a ban on GM to preserve the crops of the economic countries. And I wonder whether that's actually effective in addressing those challenges that go beyond GM. Mm -hmm. So are there like exclusive qualities to GM um, that make it especially bad, or like what is kind of the sentiment that goes particularly against GM rather than um, conventional agriculture as a whole? Mm -hmm. So, good question and, and two points. So, one is that, yeah, some people who are very adamant in favor of GM crops, what, what they will say 
is something like, well, you know, if you compare them to dimensional crops, you know, they reduce the use of some chemicals, which is in, in, in part true. But what you don't do when you do that, when you create that argument, is to step back and say, well, are there any forms other than conventional agriculture to grow and produce food, which there, there are, as you know, probably pretty well. So what GM crops do in terms of the, the comparison with conventional crops is that kind of the, they extend in time and they reproduce the monoculture approach to agriculture that creates the environmental problems that we are dealing with right now. So they still are very dependent, you know, GM crops are very dependent on fossil fuels. Uh, they contribute to our current climate crisis. And, and they don't move us away from agrochemical use. Uh, there's a great 10 minute clip that Dia Campesina put out in kind of like uh, connecting the impact of industrial agriculture in climate change uh, that I think is very useful to think about this. And the other point in terms of comparing GM crops with conventional agriculture is that one of the big differences is that the crops of the so-called Green Revolution were uh, funded by the public and promoted, you know, available for everybody. They were public goods. Whereas these seeds, uh, genetically modified seeds, are developed by global corporations, the same global corporations, that's why I showed those graphs, the same global corporations that control the seed market globally and control the agrochemical market. Um, so in a way, they are an extension of the social and environmental problems that we have been dealing with since uh, the expansion of the Green Revolution. Does that answer the question? Kind of? Yeah. No, true. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel like it seems to, to me personally more um, geared towards the individual traits that you're looking at. Yeah. Like, that's also a good listen, but then looking at like to be um, excellent for job tolerance and other traits. Mm -hmm. like, should there be like a dichotomy and like how do you take these two ends? Now that, that's a great point. I think like, uh, you know, when more, I'm, I talk about GM crops as a whole, but it, your, your point is well taken that you know BT crops are not the same as as, as uh, herbicide tolerant crops. Uh, the issue is that when you think about this in social and environmental terms, is that they tend to be promoted as these like silver bullet, like magical solutions to problems of, of hunger development and inequality, which is pure PR because like they're growing companies are selling these crops as commodities, not as as food. Uh, but you're right, and I think it's a, it's a great point that you raised that uh, it's important to look at the sort of material aspects of this and differentiate BT and down that road. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you're using atrazine instead of glyphosate, you may cause more problems, but that's not a genetically modified problem. Yeah. Right? So what do you but you can grow right? Yeah, but you can grow crops without atrazine at all. That that's yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that, that debate is going on right now as we speak in Argentina. There are certain laws to create buffer zones to prevent uh, agrochemical drifts like these ones. Uh, the problem is like one thing is uh, how this could work in theory and how it actually works in the real world. Right? So uh, I'll give you a concrete example. 
you are not supposed to use this um, you know glyphosate or Roundup if there's strong wind, right? Uh, but if you rent, you know that's how like that's how the you know the law will tell you know don't use it under these conditions. And if everybody respects that, you know, we'll be in a better place. Uh, the problem is that if you're a farmer and you rent the spraying machine and you have like only two days to get the work done, you're not gonna wait till the wind goes down because every day that goes by, you're losing money. So you're gonna have to apply the you know herbicide anyway, and you know cross the thing and expect that it doesn't reach uh, the neighboring farm. In Argentina, the, the industry has been promoting uh, best agricultural practices, uh, buenas prácticas agrícolas, they call it in Spanish. That's that's the, the battle that is going on right now between the industry saying like, well, we need to better educate farmers. Uh, and on the other side, people say, well, it's not an issue of education and using this properly. It's the whole mindset and the agricultural model that comes with it. Uh, but even in the cases where they are passing buffering laws, uh, like in a province of Argentina and the Rios, the governor vetoed the law uh, creating this buffer zone. So there's even opposition to to measures like this. Yes. Uh, yes. Is there any work being done in the public sector or universities to develop open source GG crops, such as the papaya and something like that? <coughs> Mm -hmm. being done. I don't know about the regulatory policies. Yeah. Difficult countries. There is. There's, in fact, like a potato that is about to be released uh, and is developed by a partnership between a, a private company and CONICET, which is the, the equivalent of the NSF, if you will, the, you know, the, the research uh, national is good. So there are partnerships, which to me, it speaks to the point of is this a neoliberal food regime or is a corporate food regime? Meaning that even under governance that are supposedly anti neoliberal, they promoted this kind of partnership between the private and public sector to to release kind of uh, uh, their own you know national GM crops. So there are partnerships and that I think puts an interesting twist to this argument of GM crops being, you know, dominated by Monsanto alone. In, in, in certain ways, uh, I was uh, mentioning today, there's a saying in Spanish to be más papista que el, pata, que el papa, you know, more papist than the Pope. And in many regards, the Argentine farmers are a little bit like that. They're like more into like developing <laughs> the genetics than many people uh, in the so-called global north. So yeah, they are, they are, uh, and also, they are about to, uh, there's a wheat uh, seed that's being developed, uh, developed now that drought, drought resistant wheat. Yes. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. And there are also reports on GM crops, mainly mm -hmm. GM maize and GPT, mm -hmm. which are important. And um, I want to know just now, your thoughts left that the chicken supply mm -hmm. for that. Is there any direct correlation between the, uh, to the uh, pesticide? No. Uh, herbicide and the chicken deaths. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, is any data to show that there's a direct relation between them? Yeah, uh, well, there is definitely a correlation, as you know, that doesn't mean causation. Uh, I, 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 uh, I struggle with your question in the sense that I'm not going to go and, and, and measure this and take water samples. And <laughs> I'm not going to do this because I'm, I mean, I'm a sociologist. So um, I leave that to other people to do the sort of more uh, detailed studies about uh, you know, how herbicides affect the soil and the animals. But, but what it definitely happened is that the, you know, after a very similar agrochemical drift, the chickens were like walking erratically and many of them uh, died because the water that they use is not only the runoff, but also the machines that they use, like the mosquito that I show you, when they have to wash those machines, they use the local water reservoirs to wash those, those uh, machines. So 
it may have been either that the chickens were exposed to herbicides or that they drank water that was contaminated with herbicides. Because they use, uh, I don't want to get into the technical stuff too much, but the farmers use Roundup, uh, glyphosate-based herbicide, but they also use 2,4-D and other herbicides that are much more toxic. And they use 2,4-D because before planting, a second season of soybeans, they cannot eliminate the emerging uh, soybeans with glyphosate because they come from genetic engineers that resist. So they need to, if you want to do soybeans two years in a row, when they are planting on the second year, they use 2,4-D. And that may also be uh, the cause of this. against the government authority because of the GM um, uh, soybean mm -hmm. and the, the passes can decide whether they choose the GM soybean or non-GM soybean. So all of the parents do not, peasants do not uh, grow the GM. They don't. They don't grow GM. That's the problem. That's all. Maybe can uh, maybe I can explain my idea clearly. Um, you know the farmers are very angry about uh, the GM soybean direct yes. because uh, there is some negative yeah. effects on yeah. their lives. Mm -hmm. They can decide not to plant the GM soybean. Then the negative effect of the GM well, soybean is, yeah. is settled. Yeah, but the, the, you know, what they will grow is the question because soybeans uh, have, you know, back then had very good international prices. And, and an important thing that maybe was missing, uh, or, or maybe to clarify things, is that uh, one thing are the farmers that grow soybeans, and a different social group are the small farmers or, or peasants or campesinos that were affected by these crops. So the guys grow in soybeans, they don't live there. They rent their land, they rent their land to other people to grow soybeans. And the people living in much smaller plots surrounding the soybean plots are the ones being affected. That, that's, uh, that, that <laughs> clarifies things. Other question about you? Yeah. Oh, no. Okay. You were uh, oh, Wendy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that that's the, the what you should say is just the point, the correct point that I want to raise is is that they may demobilize in the sense of not organizing sort of very public uh, confrontations with the government, but they may still mobilize in a less visible way. Uh, I don't think I have the picture here, but I attended like number of organization or of meetings and assemblies of like things like this of people seated and discussing so it's not that that they disappear because the literature uh, on social movements uh, there are several people who have studied demobilization in terms of organizations disappearing completely right or dying out and what i want to show here is that 
there's something in between those two situations between, between being very visible and vocal and confrontational and the other the other extreme being like completely disappearing as an organization. So the there are in the middle situations like the one that you described that the issue with that is that we can only get access to that through qualitative methods or, or demographic methods because they don't show up in the newspapers. <laughs> they, so so it's, it's very hard to to see them from a distance. You have to be there. You have to be in situ in real time to see them, you know, uh, to witness this this mobilization without confrontation. If you will. No, thank you. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for being here. I know you have to go, but thank you.